Hello, I'm Judith A. Yates, true crime author and criminologist. This is Best True Crime. Every episode, I take you on a journey to explore crime, forensics, and investigations. Hey everybody, I'm Judith A. Yates, true crime author and criminologist, and this is Best True Crime. What we do is we go in person or on the net to interview folks who are involved in true crime, bring you the latest information. And right now, coming to you from Canada, is Mr. Eugene Licio. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your knowledge. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. And Eugene is an expert on 3D forensics and evidence, virtual models in the courtroom, forensic animations, laser scanners for rooms, crime scenes. Tell us a little bit about what exactly you do. Well, basically what I do is I reconstruct crime scenes or accident scenes in 3D. So you have it on a computer. So this way you can like interrogate it, you can investigate it, you can measure things, but being able to visualize and put things in 3D means that you can um, have a virtual crime scene that you can revisit at some point in the future. And so for people who couldn't have been there, uh, when things are unknown and you can take physical pieces of evidence and then kind of put them all back together, it gives you an opportunity to revisit things and uh, play out scenarios, um, you know, sort of exclude things, include things, a number of different things. So um, it's really the process of, it's a sort of a three-step process. You know, the first part is the, the documentation part and where you get all the technology to document a crime scene or something like that. And the next part is what you do with that data. So that's the analysis part. Like, can you do blood stain pattern analysis? Can you do bullet trajectories? Um, are you doing some kind of a, a crash reconstruction, something like that? And then finally, at the end, uh, because these technologies are visual, they're, they're 3D, they're visual, you can see them. Um, you can combine the results of your analysis and the documentation and then be able to present them somehow for a judge and a jury. And, and yeah, and one of the benefits there is just, it's very visual. So a lot of people, they tend to pay attention because it's, it's something that is interesting to them. So I've often been in a situation where, you know, juries are looking and they're like, Hey, that's pretty cool. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. It's the documentation analysis and um, visualization of evidence in 3d using 3d technologies. Okay. And the reason that I contacted you is because I saw this fascinating thing online where it was a 3D kind of a virtual, I don't want to say virtual if that's the right word, image of a finger showing a fingerprint and it was very clean and clear and it was slowly revolved so that you're not just looking at a piece of paper with a fingerprint on it, but you are looking at, so to speak, the actual finger. Tell me a little bit right. about that. So that was interesting because, um, so I do something called photogrammetry. And so photogrammetry is a way of using a digital camera to take photographs of something and then um, put it together as a 3D model or reconstruct a, a full 3D model. So I was speaking with somebody um, who I guess had contacted me out of Texas and they said, hey, you know, I, I do stuff like macro photography on, on deceased people's fingers for identification, postmortem identification, stuff like that. So I said, okay, cool. Um, he said, could you do this on a finger? And I thought, well, yeah, I just, I hadn't really thought about trying. So uh, I, I went and I ahead and I did it. And it, it gets kind of challenging when you start getting into very, very small things. But that's what happened. I, I went and I did it. And that was the very first uh, sample that I had. So I reconstructed a the model of a, of a finger. Now, that was actually not a, it wasn't a, a I don't have any dead people to work with. So I had a cast of a finger. That's what I did. So um, if somebody's moving around, it causes problems. So uh, you need something which is very still. And so what I did was I reconstructed the model and yeah, I, I had put it online and I didn't realize people were interested in 3D models of fingers. So uh, there was a very big uh, return on that. So I thought, geez, these, these uh, and it was a lot of um, latent print examiners. So I thought, geez, what a crazy bunch these guys are. They, they, they like these uh, 3D models of fingers. So that's, that's what happened. <laughs> I, m the first thought in my head doing um, volunteer work with missing and missing persons and unsolved is one, this could help identify an individual 
who's, you know, an identified death. And two, think of how that would look in a courtroom. You are bringing virtual evidence into the courtroom. People are actually yes, seeing it in 3D. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there are, and there's, there, there are other advantages there. So there are things that you can do in 3D in terms of an analysis that you can't do you know, regularly on just a flat print. And so there's things uh, both, both from the research side and then both from a, an investigative or pra more practical side. So my thoughts here on the research side is something that I'm going to be embarking on and I'm just slowly gathering my materials and things like that. So is if you can document the person's finger in 3D um, and then, for example, you take a number of rolled prints, just flat prints, Right. You can figure out what, what a distortion model would be uh, using things like artificial intelligence or whatever. So you have this curvature to your finger. But if I do 100 people and then I take their flat prints and you roll them and you can look at the two and say, how do I get from here to a flat print? What is, what is the distortion model like? So that's some, some of the things that you can do in using modern technologies and things like artificial intelligence, 3D, all that. Um, the other side of that... Um, is that you're right, it's absolutely visual. So not only is it just something you can look on the screen, but I didn't think about this. Let me grab something behind me. But you can 3D print things. So this is a oh, 3D printed that. finger. And so it's uh, you can take things which are very small and make them large. So um, this is, you know, it's a, it's a firm plastic model and there, you can even feel the ridges. So if I you can probably hear that, so that's, you know, you can, you can scratch them and feel them, but think about, you know, color coding something like this and then taking a print from a crime scene that's been recovered and, you know, coding some interesting whirls or, you know, bifurcations or whatever they are, and then being able to take this and color code this and then hand it to a juror and say, okay, this is, this is the suspect's thumb or finger or whatever it might be. And then, you know, here's a print that's recovered, look at them yourself, right? And then you make, you know, you have an expert that will say, this is what I did, but handing this over to the jury and being able to have something physical in their hands is extremely helpful. Just from a, a retention standpoint, from a learning standpoint, sure. there's uh, some, benef some benefits in doing it this way. And, and some people are, you know, tangible learners, some people are visual learners that would really cover both. And again, like you said, a jury is passing along and, and they're paying attention and they're not thinking what's for lunch. And I think that's that's such a boon in, in crime scene. Now, you have something on your website called AI2-3D Forensics. What is that? Okay, so AI2-3D uh, came was a, so my background's in engineering, and that's, that's like an engineering mind thinking, right? We're going to make an acronym, a crazy acronym. Had I, go, had I gone back again, I would have chosen something completely different. But it stands for um, animation, uh, uh, illustration. Geez, what does it mean? Uh, oh, wait a second. No, I can't even remember what it is. AI2, that's right. Animation, imaging, and illustration. And then there's the 3D components. So AI2, 3D. And so today it's the 3D which makes up the, largest component so you know when you start something uh, if you start a business you know you think you're going to be doing something and then you turn out you know doing something else uh, it doesn't take long before you're working in some other area and so when i started out i thought i was going to be working primarily in the uh, civil cases and crashes and things like that but through a series of events that happened and people that i had met um, everything kind of migrated over to the crime side and so that's primarily the bulk of work that I do. But um, the 3D really uh, took off initially with uh, photogrammetry. So photogrammetry is one of the technologies that I use. But the reason that I got into it was I, I was getting photos from these cases. So they would say, hey, here's, here's some photos, crime scene photos or whatever. And I'd look and say, hey, did anybody measure this? Or did anybody do this? Or did anybody? And there was a lot of information that was missing, let's say, or lacking. And so uh, being able to recover that type of information from the photographs was really helpful and useful. And so using a technology like photogrammetry can allow you to do some of that. And then I started discovering other types of technologies and I was just amazed with what could be done. And once the uh, laser scanners 
hit more recently, which, you know, allow you to document whole crime scenes, indoor, outdoor. Um, I was just blown away. And, and early on, I said, yeah, this is, this is the next thing. And so uh, I'm glad I, I'm glad I pursued it. That's amazing. We're talking to Eugene Licio, and he is an expert on 3D forensics and evidence. Let me ask you this. Are we beginning to rely too much on DNA? Well, I, I wouldn't say we're relying maybe too much on DNA, but certainly there's a lot of people who are um, focused on DNA because everybody thinks, you know, if, if there's DNA there, you know, that, that's it, right? But, but DNA just tells you who, right? There's a lot of other things that need to be explained. And that's why we have some of these other disciplines, whether it's, you know, uh, footwear impressions or bloodstain pattern analysis, you know, firearms, uh, ballistics, all those types of things, they can help to explain the other things that DNA doesn't. And so in many cases, it's not about who is there. It's about, you know, what happened, right? So if there's a, if there's a crime in your home and they find your DNA there, well, who cares? It's your home, right? So you're going to be there. They, they better find, if they don't find your DNA there, they, they're probably going to scratch their heads. And so in many cases, you know, people who know each other or whatever, it's not uncommon to find their DNA there. It's, it's expected, but now it's a question of, well, you know, who pulled the trigger, who was standing where, um, you know, uh, where was this bloodstain impact coming from? There's, there's a lot of other questions that can uh, help uh, the jury or, you know, the judge or, or whatever the case may be. And, uh, and like many situations, it's not about one particular piece of evidence. Maybe there's some cases where, you know, one piece of evidence plays a larger role than others, but usually it's the sum total of a number of things. And I found in in doing this work over time is that and i'm pretty good about visualizing things in my head in 3d i kind of know you know getting to a point where i can kind of expect to see certain things um, but i'm amazed sometimes where you know you take something like a shooting reconstruction and you start putting things together where you learn things that you just you just it, they're very difficult to visualize and for those people who are not you know, thinking in 3D, maybe, maybe like myself, or maybe some of my colleagues, it really helps to see it. And when you can see it visually on a screen, on a monitor, um, there's just a lot of, uh, a lot of benefits. And I think, I think it adds a component, um, an important component, but, you know, and, and I wouldn't, you know, it's in my area, so I don't be biased and say, oh, it's you know, the most important thing. It's not. I mean, sometimes we play a very small part, but thinking again about the sum total of the, uh, you know, of all the evidence, that's really what's important. And actually, I want to say something. You, you made a point before about the fact that, you know, it's, it's, you know, jurors like thinking about lunch. This is a really important point because I've been at trial before where the judge says, he looks over and the jury's nodding off and he's like, okay, we got to take a break because they're not listening anymore. They're not paying attention. And fortunately, I can say that, you know, often when I'm presenting my work in 3D and they're looking at it on a screen or whatever, they usually don't fall asleep. And so for that, I'm kind of grateful because I, I get an opportunity to, sh to show off something which is visually more appealing and more interesting. So um, I've even had jurors say to me after, that was super cool, you know, like this is, that was really great or whatever, you know? So um, I think the fact that it is something which can grab your attention uh, is really important because the, jur the jury can learn from something like that. What about admissibility in court? Your, your work well, is admissible. Have you ever yeah, had um, I mean, well, I can tell you that um, it depends on it depends on the court and it depends on the, the judge. And there have been times where, um, you know, I, I thought, wow, this, you know, the judge should raise an issue here and no problem at all. It just, you know, it walks right in. So for the most part, it's admissible. I mean, th this type of evidence, 3D evidence and stuff like that is nothing new, for example, like brand new. It's, it's been around for a long time you know, um, starting, you know, more, more in Europe in about 2005 and over here since about 2009, 2010, it's really, really being adopted more and more and more. And there is a long list of cases now where, you know, 3D technologies have been used. So the admissibility is really not that big of a deal. It's really how you use it and what you do with it. And so, for example, 
if you, you know, if I, if I create a, a, some kind of a shooting reconstruction and we maybe don't know who the shooter is, but all of a sudden I put in a character that looks like the suspect, they're going to say, well, look, that looks kind of, it's kind of biased, don't you think? So oftentimes what we do is we just put, put in like a, a skeleton type figure or just a humanoid type character that just, you know, doesn't look like anybody. It's blue or it's green or whatever. Um, so, you know, we try to uh, be careful when it comes to prejudice and uh, trying to uh, influence somebody for what they see. Um, but I haven't had, I haven't had very, I haven't had too many problems. There've been a couple of situations where, you know, the judges said, well, you know, I, we won't, we won't allow this particular image in, but we'll allow everything else, you know? So there's like one or two things where maybe they were sensitive about. Um, maybe I didn't always agree or, or you know, uh, whatever, but um, you know, that's, that's just the way it goes. The judge is the gatekeeper and uh, depending on who the judge is, some things will go in some cases and some things won't in others. Okay. Now your company offers training on 3d photogrammetry. Yes. How does a person watching right now take that course? Do they have to be a law enforcement officer? Do they have to be a, a you know, in investigation? How can they take that course? Yeah, no, you can be, anybody can take the course. In fact, I've had people even from other areas. Um, I do tend to focus on forensics. That's my main sort of, uh, you know, family focus, if you want to look at it and say it that way. Um, but I've had people from the film and gaming industries. I've had archaeologists. I've had uh, architects. I've had a number of different people who, who have joined in. And really, if you think about it, it's, it's really a it's, it's a, it's a measurement technology, you know, so it's like giving you a tape measure and saying, go measure stuff. Well, you can use it for forensics and you can use it for whatever, you know, measure your house or, or whatever you want. And so I usually, uh, normally what I do with the courses are, I usually put on webinars or I, I, I do some uh, free material that I put online and I just make people aware about the technology and what it can do for them and uh, give them some background, some history, how it works, different software options and things like that. So there's usually about four hours of free um, uh, stuff that I put online. And to be honest, there's a strategy there. And the reason is it's all the theory for the course. So I don't have to work on doing the theory. If people watch that, it's out of the way. And then we can just focus on the, uh, the technology aspect, which is working with the software hands-on and doing all the processing and everything else. So, um, you don't have to be, you know, a technical engineer, whatever. Basically, I take people from the very beginning and work, you know, through their way through so that they're creating their own models. There is some camera work, so you have to be somewhat comfortable with it with a camera, but we do a couple of little exercises there. Um, but, you know, if you, you know, if you have a camera and you're willing to take a little bit of time to work with it, um, you'll be able to reconstruct and create you know, really good looking 3D models and then create those little videos just like you, you know, with the finger, with the finger and, and uh, different types of things. So they can produce their own models and then also provide little videos that they can put online. Okay. And if somebody's interested in taking one of these courses, what do they need to do? How do they get started? Well, uh, so normally I announce it online and that sort of thing, but if they aren't, uh, you know, if like right now I'm taking a break for the summer, but I'll definitely be coming back again. I'm just, I just finished the last course last week. Um, but uh, through my website, they can just contact me on the, uh, on the contact form, or you can just send me an email at uh, information at ai2-3d.com and just say, hey, I'm interested in the course. And then I can get you on the, like a mailing list or just an information list that uh, the next time I launch it, uh, it'll get announced to a whole bunch of people and then they can see it and then opt in if they like. Okay. And you have a video channel on YouTube. Also, tell me about that. Yeah, so there are two right now. So one of them is called uh, Click 3D. So Click 3D is the one where I focus on 3D technologies and do more of the techie stuff and kind of explain photogrammetry and laser scanning and a lot of uh, technical stuff. Um, so for people who like to learn more or, or like to you know learn about the different aspects, that's what that's there for. The other one is called Forensics Talks. And so much like you, um, I interview people in different disciplines in forensics and really focus on, you know, um, just bloodstain pattern analysis and shooting reconstruction and, and things that are like way out of my wheelhouse, uh, so to speak. And uh, originally I thought, you know, hey, I'll just do it on my work, the 3D stuff and interview people. And 
it took me about two minutes to realize that's a bad idea. Just I better expand that into other areas. And it's more interesting for me too. So um, yeah, if anyone's interested in that, uh, it's called Forensics Talks and the channel is th called 3D Forensics. So you should be able to find it on YouTube. And it's definitely interesting. Definitely. Yeah. You, you're good at keeping people's attention. You're good at explaining things, breaking it down for quote unquote, the common man, people like me who are going now, what? <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's very good. Um, give us your website, give us your contact information. If somebody wants to watch one of the videos, if somebody wants to take the course, tell me your website. Yeah, so the website is just going to be AI2, that's like number two, then dash 3D.com. So AI2 3D.com. If you go there, um, it has links to the uh, forensics talks um, so that you, you link right to the YouTube channel, or whatever. You can see that there. Um, if you want to just email me, uh, we have an information at AI2 3D.com. And so anyone is more than welcome to send that. That actually comes right to me. So I, I get to see that as, as well. And I, and I try to respond. Um, to as many um, emails as, as I can. So I'm pretty good about that. Um, yeah, and that's the best. There's also a contact form on the website if somebody just wants to you know, drop in something there as well. So that's an option too. Okay. And is there anything yeah. else that you want to add? Oh boy. Well, um, I know it's always a trick question, I, isn't it? Yeah, it is a kind of a trick question. I mean, it, you know, you can, you can talk for a very long time, you know, on something like this, but um, you know, um, I'm, I spend a lot of time doing research and that's, that's a big thing. So um, there's, there are many areas where 3D technologies can be applied to, um, you know, like, uh, like for example, uh, just Saturday, I was at a, a shooting range and we're doing some ballistic tests on, on a vehicle and looking at new methods and how they can be improved. And, um, you know, 3D technologies, um, th they have a lot of benefits because they allow you to do things that you can't do by hand alone. And some of the real positive things that we're seeing when using these technologies is, you know, people can do stuff by hand, like taking, you know, regular simple tools and, and you know, taking measurements or whatever. But one of the things that we're finding is, um, you know, a lot of the errors and a lot of the extreme values that you sometimes get in these areas are being minimized by using these types of technologies, which is really good because you don't want to get into a situation where that one time, you know, that measurement is like way out or, or something that you're doing is off the norm, right? So you want to minimize those extreme things because um, you don't want to be that guy on the, on the case, you know, up, at, up on the stand, you know, thinking that you're here, but you're actually someplace else. So yeah, there's a lot of different aspects to, uh, to this particular area. A um, lot, lot of good students that I'm working with. I teach at the University of Toronto in the Forensic Science Program. So, you know, a little shout out to them. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's nice to see that a lot of people are really coming on board nowadays. Because when I started, it wasn't like that. It was, a hard, it was a hard sell because nobody said, they said, hey, that's cool, but we don't know what to do with it. We've never, <laughs> we, we haven't seen it kind of thing. So it was a bit of a push, but yeah, no, that, that's all I'll say. There, there's, there's quite a bit there. Um, I really enjoy it. I enjoy what I do. I'm very fortunate and that's about it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you for being here and explaining this to us and, and give it an insight into the future of our criminal investigation. And what I really love uh, looking to see who this person is, that's a, a Jane Doe or a John Doe identifying them. I love that fact. And we put the bad guys away and we keep the innocent guys out of trouble. Anything that's going to help that I, I'm interested in, I just love today. So thank you, Eugene, for being here all the way from Toronto. And yes. uh, have a fabulous day. Thank you very much. You have a great week. You want to attend True Crime Cons, conferences, training, meet the authors, and you've been searching World Wide Web, searching for true crime events? Well, now you have to troll no more because all of that information is now on one page. True Crime Events can be found on www.truecrimebook.net. That's right, award-winning authors Sonova Cantrell and Judith A. Yates bring you a list of cons, conferences, book signing, book release, special event, anything in all true crime. You can even earn your badge by becoming a member and be the first to learn about events, be eligible for prizes, and receive free gifts. So go to True Crime Events at www.truecrimebook.net. Be the first to learn about conferences and all things true crime. 
and be in the know. Hello, I'm Judith A. Yates, true crime author and criminologist. This is Best True Crime. Every episode, I take you on a journey to explore crime, forensics, and investigations.